Chapter 2 An hour passed. Both of us were tired, too exhausted to even remember. But I could see Soto introspect. He looked as if he were deeply fallen down into a reverie, wanting nothing more than to sleep. We asked our questions. We told the truth. I had forgotten much, and it made me sad. Manco Inca, Soto said. Did you catch him? No, we never found him. I hadn't thought about Manco for years. I stared again at Soto's eyes. They were filled with pain. Then I asked about the Pizarros. But when I brought up the subject, he responded cold and flatly. They all died. And there was nothing more he wished to say about them. Then Soto began to ask me strange questions. He asked about Cabeza de Vaca. That name sounded vague. But in reality, that man was the very reason I had entered the desert. Did you see Cabeza de Vaca? Did you see Nunez? No. Then who did you follow? We followed his slave. His slave? No, that's not true. We followed a monk who followed the slave. And when I said those words, Soto simply laughed because it was true and absurd. As Soto stared at the flame, his sword became deep red. He stoked the flame and inhaled the smoke. And I looked up at the meandering evening stars. What's your story, Soto? Who did you follow? He paused and drifted his eyes. Then he allowed himself to think, and he went deep into his reverie. Back to Spain. Back when everything had made sense. And there Soto went. 1539. The year of our Lord. It was only four years ago. And Soto found himself Lord of the Manor of La Matestra in Seville. Which was now his own. Each night, Soto lay beside his wife, and each morning, his wife remained alone. Because before each sunrise, Soto stood before a locked room and stared at his fortune. The room was cold and gray and finely swept. In the middle of the room, thousands of rubies and pearls were piled onto blood-stained swords. Along the outside walls, was a painting of Soto himself, dignified and blessed. And at the head of the mantle were the stuffed heads of the great puma and complimentary jaguar. Then, of course, were the two marvelous beasts he had slain in Peru, his favorite souvenirs. But what mattered most were the twelve chests in the corner of the room, which were all his riches and glory of Peru. Three chests were filled with rubies. Three chests were filled with pearls. And six of the chests were filled with gold. And with each treasure, a story and a memory. And as he stared, Soto thought long about the great Atahualpa and his swift execution. He thought about the sweat and tears Atahualpa held and all the prayers he sang which went unanswered. And he thought about the smile each Pizarro gave him on that day. And how the whole of Carimaca screamed. And the more Soto thought, the more he thought of the fate of each Pizarro. And how they all died in their own way. In three years, 
everything had changed. Old Francisco was murdered at the hands of Almagro's son, Diego. Gonzalo and his cousin, Tariana, betrayed and abandoned each other on their quest for El Dorado and were never heard from again. And when Hernando, the responsible and noble Pizarro, the caretaker of Cusco, refused to obey the crown, he too suffered the same fate as his brothers. But out of all the Pizarros, Soto thought mostly about Francisco. And as he looked at himself in the mirror, Soto quickly came to a realization. He realized that he was no longer Captain Soto of the Pizarros. He was now Don Hernando, and very much his own man. But oddly, there was no joy on his face. And as the hours passed, Soto thought more about Peru and what it must have looked like at the present moment. The thoughts dissipated. Soto opened his eyes. He was bewildered, alive, but still unsatisfied. His face let out heavy sighs of quiet despair. Something was missing. There was an ache and a pain. When he grew tired of his fortune, Soto moved out of his room and out into his hometown, Jerez de los Caraberos, and he walked for endless hours. He attended weddings and festivals and was treated as the guest of honor. He dined with the court and drank the finest wine with every dignitary included in the king. But after a month of this, the joy had faded. And after six months, Soto's goodwill completely dissolved into bitter despair. At night, he walked in his sleep and strolled about the city as if he were a deranged lion. He swore and cursed and marched as if he were still in Peru. And though his wife comforted him the best she could, the Soto of the jungle remained. Having been in Spain for nearly a year, Soto's face looked forever agitated. He scowled most of the time. And in his days of relaxation, a glaring sadness of boredom seemed to be an internal fever which he could not escape. Yet the only thing that seemed to quell Soto were the men who returned ashore. They were bankers, beggars, and slaves. And they all had stories to tell. Stories naturally led to rumors. And the daily reports from Peru and Mexico flooded throughout the land. But La Florida remained the mysteries of all mysteries and Soto and the rest of Spain became obsessed with it. Both Ponce de Leon and Panfilo de Naves explored the land, and absurd fantasies of a fountain of youth and a mountain of silver dazzled Spanish ears for months on end. And after each conversation with the men, Soto fell deeper and deeper into trance. More months passed, and all Soto could think about was La Florida. His mind schemed like the rising sun. He calculated how much he would need and what he would find. And back he found himself in his treasure room with maps of La Florida covering his desk. And he stared with heavy eyes onto a map of a peninsula a stretch to an enormous land filled with mountains, rivers, and gold. It was a land that was explored, but it was not conquered. All of Mexico and Peru had been claimed, but La Florida had not. And Soto studied the maps in solemn silence, like a rabbi studying the Talmud. On one day, when he was deep in his study, 
Soto heard a rat scurry into one of the crevices behind the wall. It left a trail of dung on one of the maps, and Soto went after it with his sword. Later, he spotted the same rat chewing on a necklace of gold. Again, Soto chased after it, but the rat snuck inside the wall and hid beneath the crevices. Soto laughed, then left the room. About five minutes later, he returned with his bloodhound. It took most of the afternoon, but the dog did its job. He caught the rat, tore its back, and chewed it until it died. And when the dog was through, Soto stomped on the rat and watched the blood pour down the stone floor. More months had passed, and Soto remained alone. He looked back to the chest and all of his treasure, and his familiar scowl returned. And each day, an inevitable fact had returned to him, because each day, his fortune seemed smaller and smaller. La Florida, the next obsession. All of Spain wanted to know more. But the man who made La Florida true was the strangest man of all Spain. His given name was Alva Nunez. But for the rest of time, he was known as Cabeza de Vaca. He had spent seven years journeying from La Florida back to New Spain and his was the most anticipated return since Cortez. Much that was said of him was made up, but the truth of the matter was that Nunez was indeed the last survivor of the Naves Entrada some twelve years ago, and when his ship returned to shore, all of Spain had collectively lost their minds. Rumors of him had spread from Mexico down all the way through Havana, his boat had been sighted in due course and was ordered to be protected by King Charles himself. And with Spain still doused in rumors, all knew that whatever Nunez had to offer would spark, ignite, and remind the whole of Spain of their old best dreams. On the day his ship landed, he was greeted by rich and poor men who had traveled 50 miles just to hear his tales. However, Nunez had no time. He was ushered by a dozen soldiers and summoned to appear to the royal court. And in two hours, he found himself on the grand dining table of King Charles himself. And as he made his way to the testifying chair, he stared at his audience. The room was filled to capacity and the king and Soto sat with their backs firmly pressed against their chairs. For two days, Nunez gave his testimony to the court. He was asked question after question by the dignitaries, but his answers were vague and filled with speculation. Nunez was the treasurer of the Navaez expedition, and being the treasurer, all had thought he would answer in logical, sparse, and concise tones. But when Nunez spoke, he seemed startled, and at times, incomprehensible, as if he suddenly forgot how to speak Spanish. And as he told his story, it became clear that Nunez was a man who endured all too much. He was tall and lean, and his thick beard came down to his waist. He smelled of shit and looked like a beggar and oftentimes he would switch and speak different languages. All listened and tried to comprehend. Much like Marcos, he spoke of grand tales, but unlike Marcos, Nunez's face was not of joy. Instead, there was a pang of sadness with each tale he told. He spoke of how strange and wondrous La Florida was, and how his captain Panfilo de Navares and his entrada were ransacked by Indians, and how they were forced to eat their own horses to survive. 
He also told the tale of how the surviving members of the Entrada made rafts and sailed the ocean to another land, and how he and his three partners became enslaved by the Indians, and his story went on and on. As the second day ended, the dignitaries closed their questioning and asked Nunez to estimate how much gold there was to be had. And Nunez, being the treasurer, spoke of gold, silver, and gems he found in the mountains. But he gave no specifics. Instead, he changed the subject to more ethereal things, like the ever-present God and the healing of one soul. And all but the clergy had understood a word he said. And after he finished, he was served immunity and issued out of the court and commanded not to say another word about the new land. And all were ordered to leave him be. But that did not dissuade the other court. That is, the court of popular opinion. Those who did attend the hearings made up their own stories and repeated them. And so the rumor spread across the land and flared like the raging hot sun. Throughout each day and well into the night, the men told and retold Nunez's tale with flights of fancy and wondrous ecstasy. La Florida is dangerous. They say there are dragons, fire-breathing beasts. He said they ate their own horses. I heard him speak. I was there. He spoke of other things. What did he see? Gold? Silver? Both. More! But he also spoke of the women, naked as the day they were born. Just like they said in Mexico. Just like they said in Peru. He's a liar. He's a goddamn fool. He lost his mind a long time ago. How can anybody believe him? starting to doubt myself. Surely there's something there. Surely it's worth something. Nah, it's too risky. I guess it's the king's decision. Whose else could it be? This Nunez, this Cabeza de Vaca, or whatever they call him, he's a fraud. A madman. He could be. Or, he could be the answer to our fortunes. He's a waste of time. Only a fool can believe his lies. But, as ordered by the king, Nunez lived in isolation. And although many tried, Nunez refused to speak with anyone. On one morning, Nunez greeted the sunrise. And as he gazed at the ocean, all thoughts and memories came to the surface. The waves crashed, and each time they did, he slipped and fell, and remembered. And when he dried off, he made it back to his pen and piece of parchment, and made another entry in his diary. But, for whatever reason, the words simply did not come. Another day came and Nunez returned to shore. He stared to the shore and breathed in and out, trying to find the rhythm. He closed his eyes, and once he did, the reveries and the horror quickly burst into snaps of light. All the memories of a decade came rushing through his veins. A beach. A jungle. A desert wasteland bloodied corpses and endless swamps. His captain, Naves, standing on a skull, holding a bloody sword. And his friend, Ortiz, who had been captured and tortured. When the vision vanished, Nunez stood up and raised his hands. And when he opened his eyes, cold sweat ran down his face. He rushed back to his inn, went to his pen and paper, and wrote down one single word. La Florida. He stared at the word, and the word stared back. And as he closed his eyes to pray, he sensed somebody watching him. 
He turned his back, left, then right, but there was not a soul. And when he realized it, he returned to his pen. He had very little ink, but he wrote for hours. Somehow, he was able to remember everything, and his words soon surrendered from his mind and on to the page. He wrote from sunup until midday, until he just could not bear. And in the morning, Nunez returned to shore and gazed at the ocean. But there was one man who saw his every move that day. The man could not let go of his stare. The man wanted nothing other than to go back into the void and find another kingdom. And that man was Soto. Soto was still obsessed. He was still consumed. And for a week, he met Nunez before the morning tide and greeted him with a smile. For many, Nunez remained a disheveled man who spoke in tongues and who had clearly lost his mind. But to Soto, Nunez was everything. He contained vital and holy knowledge and Soto persisted to squeeze every ounce of juice left in his soul. You and I have more in common than you think, he said to Nunez. They tell me a lot about you. I've heard your tale. I believe it. You don't need to convince me. You saw what you saw. I was there. I was in Peru. These bastards couldn't dream an ounce of what we saw. But still, Nunez remained silent. He remained lost in the gaze of the ocean, its salt and its waves, and the water came to his boots. You and I have a lot in common, Nunez. We've been freed. Yet, are we kings? Do we look as such? How far did Navaez go? Soto waited patiently, but Nunez gave no response. They call you Cabeza de Vaca. That's a strange name, isn't it? Is it a family name? It must be. And that's how they'll refer to you decades after you're gone. Cabeza de Vaca, that strange man. The next days passed, but still, Soto persisted. You're a man of few words, Nunez. I respect that. They call us madmen, dreamers, people who are unwilling to face reality. That's what we are. But they haven't seen what we saw, my friend. That is why they don't understand. And on the final day, Soto uttered the words that pain Nunez the most. La Ferrarida must be beautiful. That new world, I miss it very much. But do you know why, Nunez? All I had to deal with were savages. Savages only hide or need to be killed. This old world, this old Spain, it's filled with dignitaries, laws, morals, things that should not exist. I no longer trust old Spain. I much rather trust the savages. At least the savages of the new world have more to offer, more to hide. Those savages, Nunez, those beautiful savages. You remember them, don't you? Then Nunez finally spoke. He gripped Soto's arms and looked him straight in the eye. They are people. They are not savages. They are people. 
just like you and me. Remember that. And when Nunez let go of his stare, Soto smiled and departed, and never sought out Nunez ever again. And when Soto returned to his castle, he smiled. His future was settled and cleared, for it now all came down to a simple objective, to convince the king and afford a charter. It would be the last entrada to La Florida, and the dream would continue. The night continued. It had gotten cold and damp. The tops of the trees swayed as the winds grew stronger. I drew closer to the fire. But still, the silence remained. I wanted to say a word but none came to me. And as I stared at Soto, I saw him talking to himself. He completely forgot I was there. His face was gray. He whispered incoherently for minutes on end, as if to recapture. And it was then that I knew Soto had truly lost his mind. He said three words. La Florida, the lady, the king. He mumbled and repeated, The lady, the king, are all dead now, dead and buried. He ached and winced, then he yawned loudly. He spat to the fire and breathed with an open mouth. He reached into his pouch, and when he unveiled its cloth, I knew immediately what it was. It was the board. It was the very board he carried in Peru. He reached into his pouch and took out all the pieces. They seemed much smaller. They looked withered. There were cracks and chips in each stone. The game. The terrible game that taught me so long ago again stared me square in the face. But I wasn't shocked. Eventually, I knew I would see it again. I tried to think about the last time I played. It was with Tovar, back in the plains, the stalemate no one had won. I looked at Soto, and he looked at me. No, I said. No what? I can't play. Soto laughed. Are you afraid? No. And why? I'm tired. Being tired is no reason. Every man in this army is tired. God is tired. What makes you so special? I have no interest, Soto. This is not about interest. This is about proving what you learned. Not just to me, but to yourself. I looked at his hand. It was scarred and burnt. It was black and locked into place. He aligned the pieces across the board. And as I looked at his hands again, I thought of all the souls he had strangled. And in my mind, I heard all their screams. Then, finally, the words I wanted to say spilled out into the open air. Why do you play this game? He looked at me long and hard. He wasn't puzzled, but he was agitated. He paused and thought long and hard about the question. Then he answered. I play for my mind, Sardina. Your mind? I want to see if I still have it. There was another pause after all the pieces were set. The leaves rustled and swooped and tussled against the fire. 
I thought about you a long time, my friend, he said. I didn't think I'd ever see you again. Let's see what you've learned. I looked at his eyes. He looked as if he would die at any second. Then he reached over and tried to hand me a piece, but I refused. Take it, he said. I paused and looked at his eyes again. They were red. They were filled with hatred, pain, and unyielding rage. Then he shoved my shoulder, primed open my hand, and placed the piece inside. Take it. Take it. Soto forced his will and repeated his words. He too thought of the last game he played with another human being. It was a little more than four years ago, but it was not with Sardina. Instead, it was with the king, Charles V of Holy Spain. What was at stake was his charter to La Florida, and the only man he had left to convince was the king himself. For two straight months, the king denied Soto's charter. He did so with grace and kindness, explaining all the failures that was of Navaez and all the disappointments Ponce de Leon had surmounted. And he did so on three separate occasions. But it was the fourth time which mattered. And over a drunken night, the king once again invited Soto to his palace to dine. They talked, and Soto pleaded his case, and again the king denied him. And as the night went on, they ate and drank, and drank again. Then the king stood up and asked Soto to follow him. The king waddled. Having a tremendous fit of gout, he hobbled and leaned his weight on his stronger foot, and finally he made his way to a locked room. He handed Soto a torch, and they went inside. Inside was all the royal treasure that amounted through the years. There were ten years of treasure. Soto's room was a sixteenth of the size. As you know, this is the reward, said the king. Should have been more. He yawned and clutched at his stomach. Then he closed the door. But as you know too, Soto, the risk is much greater. You understand my hesitancy. I do, my liege, said Soto. There is too much risk in La Florida. Too many things can go wrong. I can't afford to lose you, Soto. I know the risk, but I'm afraid if we don't, we might miss the tide. I'm sure you know it's history. I know it's history. Then you know of Navaez. I shall warn you once more that Navaez had the same obsession of La Florida. Navaez never returned from La Florida. He's presumed dead. That was eleven years ago. Excuse my frankness, my lord, but Navaez was an idiot. I hate to agree. Why is that, sir? Because I signed his charter. There was a bit of silence. The king took his chalice and finished all the wine. You look broken, Soto. I am. Why? I'm bored. To be honest with you, my liege, I haven't been so bored in all my life. But why? Doesn't Spain have everything? Is this not your homeland? It is my homeland. But the new world seems to be where my heart lies. What the jungle had, I cannot begin to describe. But I thought you said it was hellish. Wasn't it you who said it was the worst place God created? 
It was. But I long to return to it. I have to chase this final dream. You're still hungry. I am your grace. I've waited too long. Yes, that was intentional. I wanted to know what kind of man you were. So far, you've passed that test. Now on to the final test. The king held out his hand and uncovered a piece. It was a black bishop. He hobbled towards the oak table and sat down. Soto followed and sat across. On the table was a chessboard and two chalices of wine. I heard you were an excellent player. You'll get your charter. But you have to beat me first. So they played. They held up their chalices and sipped slowly. Soto glared at the board with hard eyes, and the king smiled. His eyes fluttered and waved. In the opening moves, the king forced a gambit and took Soto's knight. But the second he did, he fell into Soto's trap. The king moved his bishop. Soto captured another pawn. And after another two moves, Soto cornered the king's queen and later his castle. More mistakes followed and the king lost more and more pieces and Soto took piece after piece with tremendous joy. Then the king tried a desperate maneuver to check Soto from afar, but Soto easily deflected it with his corner pawn. Then after a couple more moves, Soto closed the game and made it. In total, it only took 13 moves. The king sat in his chair. He was baffled, yet not all too surprised. You're certainly cruel enough, Soto, he said. That's part of the game, my lord, said Soto. You've played this game too long. Your methods are beyond me. Each man has his own method. Luckily, few men can see mine. I can see parts of it. Not the whole thing, though. This is a maddening game, Soto. I shan't play it any longer. Especially with you. Well, you've beaten me. And a deal's a deal. You've got your charter. Anything else you want, you son of a bitch? No, your majesty. Lucky for you, I have a sense of humor, said the king. Yes, your liege, replied Soto. A long silence lingered. After the game, a servant entered the room and handed the king a map of La Florida. Soto then drew up a chair and studied the map with him. Then the king spoke again and broke the silence. You must have a lot of trust in Nunez. Yes. Can I ask you why? He's a madman. As I am, your highness. We understand each other. You believe him? Yes. Yes, I do, your majesty. Belief is a strange thing, is it not? It is, your grace. I believe you, Soto. I shouldn't, but I do. If there is any man who is to conquer La Florida, it is you. Thank you, my lord. Just a word of warning. Yes, my leech. The game changes when you have total control. Keep steadfast. Keep your mind rested. And keep your glass full. You'll have your charter, Soto. I hope you find it all. And as the king approached his table, he picked up the parchment and quilled his signature and the entrada was finally made official. Then the king merely raised his glass, and Soto stared, smiled, and did the same.
Once the entrada became official, word spread like wildfire. Through the autumn, Soto recruited his men and assembled his chief captains, all of which he knew personally. He aligned several from Seville, including Moscoso de Alvarado and Balthasar de la Gallegos, whom he noted to be his Hidalgo captains. Others included Juan Anasco, who was the greatest mariner and cosmographer of all of Spain, and the royal factor and the king's agent, Hernández de Bedima. Later, both Nuno de Tabar and Alferez Diego Tinaco were summoned and pronounced captains of the cavalry. And later still, Pedro Calderón, the Portuguese, André de Vancocelos, and Cristal de Espandola were all promoted to Soto's personal guard. But before the ships came to the docks, Soto made his preparations and gathered even more men, including blacksmiths, butchers, pursers, boatswains, caulkers, general duty sailors, field marshals, and millers and weavers. But Soto favored and spent most of his time with the blacksmiths. They mostly held from Toledo, and Soto handpicked all of them. Soto worked side by side with them. He pounded and hammered out his own swords, and when he finished, the smoke arose. And he stood and smiled and beheld the final deadly product of beautiful Spanish steel. After several more months of gathering the men and supplies, the boats finally landed on shore. Hundreds of men from Spain and Portugal paid their fare and joined the Entrada. But before the ships left, the hundreds of men had waited, and along the sand stood two young men, Hector and Vicente. They were only 18 years old and stood the poorest men in line. They both came from Badojas. Vicente was tall and prideful, with a brimming face of confidence. Hector, though, was much shorter, timid, and jittery. But both remained poor boys with lofty, aimless, and unattainable dreams. And, like all the rest, they stared at the ship and spoke painful, obvious words. I spent my entire savings, said Hector. Everything all of my father's fortune. I have two, said Vicente. I have no memory of them left. I invested it all into this, said Hector. We'll have to make our memories, Vicente responded. But it's worth it, Hector. It is. It's worth everything. Because it is everything. But as the ships came to shore, their staring had ceased. There were ten ships. An hour later, another ten ships arrived. The men loaded all they had brought, and the scribes and secretaries recorded it all. They brought the essentials. Hundreds of pounds of cured meat and cheese, along with hundreds of bottles of wine and olive oil. Those who could afford them brought their horses. White horses from Balano, drought horses, and black Arabians that seemed the biggest beast of all. But aside from the horses, the men carried slings of arrows, coats of mail, sharp lances, ropes, saddle bows, crossbows, spades, baskets filled with gunpowder, and dozens and dozens of arquebuses, freshly made and polished. After the ships were loaded, the hundreds of men came to attention and gathered, and Soto approached them. He spat to the sand and looked back at the waves. Soto shook hands with the king, and the man waited for his speech, but no speech was given. Instead, Moscoso did the talking, and the formalities followed. A prisoner was brought forward to Soto. The captains incited his crime, which was petty theft. But rather than scold the man, 
Soto grabbed the man by his hair and hacked off his smallest finger. The man screamed and blood dripped and gushed to the ground. Soto wiped his blade and made no other gesture. The man then was arrested in chains and brought off the ship. Then the king said his last words. God be with you, Don Hernando. Then Soto bowed, gave the signal, and climbed on board. The cheers subsided into silence, and the tide took over. Then the good south wind propelled, and the ships left shore. And on the sands, not too far from the jagged hilled slopes, stood Alvar Nunez, the man forever to be known as Cabeza de Vaca. He stared at the very last ship that was in view. Then he closed his eyes, bent to his knees, and mouthed a prayer. When he finished, he stood back up. And when he opened his eyes, all that was left was the ocean. <laughs>